<laughs> Why does grace change everything? Well, for some, to be blunt, grace doesn't change anything. As a matter of fact, they tend to act like grace is deserved or somehow they're appointed to grace and so they just accept it, run with it, and then abuse it. For others, grace is something that only a person can give, so you can't take it as an inanimate object, but you have to respond to it in the sense of someone giving it to you or bestowing it to you, like in mercy. You can't say, well, I have mercy, unless someone is being merciful to you. When they give you mercy, that means that they could have condemned you, but rather they chose to be merciful to you. And in a lot of ways, I think that's where we make our mistake, is that we think we get to pick and choose what we want to do and what we want to lose. We think that we can play God and act in the behalf of God in order to make God do what we want Him to, as opposed to what He has already said He has done. Because we find that God sets his own standard for us. We don't set the standard. That's religion. We must adapt to his standard, and that's relationship. And as we do, then we find that we need grace in order to meet that which God is doing in us to accomplish for us what we can't do for ourselves. What's the standard? <clears throat> Those who believe that they can be made acceptable to God without Jesus need to deal with some very crucial questions. If they believe they can make it to heaven by achieving a certain level of goodness, what standard do they have to live up to? What will God require of them? So many say, I feel that I am basically a kind and good person and am willing to stand before God on my own merit. After all, if I'm good, isn't that good enough? But these people fail to take into account that God's standards are different than our standards. Jesus showed us God's requirements for those who would strive for heaven on their own power when he said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. From Matthew 5:48. The standard then was set. The standard for the person who wants to be right with God is nothing short of absolute perfection. Not just trying hard or being sincere or thinking they're good, but a flawless keeping of all God ever intended for man. Clearly, those who believe they can earn eternal life by their good works have a distorted understanding of the holiness of God and what it meant to be right with God. If we're going to set up a standard of righteousness or a righteous conduct, a way of acting, we need to use the one established by Jesus Christ. We need to use the one established by Jesus because Jesus is the only person whose life prompted God to say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, Matthew 3.17. To enjoy fellowship with God, to have a relationship with God, to know him, we must be as righteous as Jesus. In John 16, 8 and 10, Jesus said, And when he, that is, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will reprove the world of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Jesus' ascension into heaven was God's witness to the world, saying, This is is the righteousness that I will accept in heaven. Otherwise, Jesus could not be raised from the dead and taken to heaven. If I want to be accepted by God, I must be as righteous as Jesus Christ himself. The scriptures show there is only one kind of righteousness that God will accept, the very righteousness of Christ himself. So if we want to stand before God on the basis of our own good works, we must live a life that measures up to the goodness we see in Jesus. People like to say that Jesus was a good man. People like to say that Jesus was a holy man. People like to say that Jesus was a godly man. 
But do you realize that God said Jesus was a perfect man? Hmm. So, if Jesus was perfect, then it is possible that there needs to be a perfection to be acceptable to God. Because God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So, God chose his own son to be the standard for us. And Paul tells us later that he would bring many sons to the Father. There must be some kind of way that God is going to communicate that righteousness that Jesus has to us so that we could measure up to the same standard that God required of Jesus because he's applying it to all of us. He doesn't leave anything left out, so he takes and makes it impossible for us to measure up to God's standard so that we would not be able to claim that we could get there any other way except through God's grace or God's favor or God's mercy extended to us. And as we read how God chooses to extend that mercy, as we discover how God wants to pour out his grace upon us, as we find in ourselves that God loves us, that God is going to do something for us, that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, we discover it's not enough to just kind of like know that, you know, Jesus did it, and that there must be something else that involves God to allow us to be a part of that nature that Jesus has so we would be acceptable to God. And what we call that is grace. It is grace, it is by grace that you are saved and that not of yourselves, but it is a gift from God. So as we study grace and as we see how it is given to us, by God himself, then we discover how it works in us to change things for us so that we would be acceptable to God, so that we would be made perfect to God. And that's why grace can change things for you today. If you could accept the idea that God is for you, that God loves you, and that God can be with you, then you would be able to find that the grace you have been given will bring you to salvation, not just of the Lord, but that He would be able to work in you salvation outward to others around you. And you would see that grace changes everything in your life as it makes your life perfect before God.